man's home, his castle. Be it ever so humble, there's no place like home. We've heard these words time and again, and yet it's difficult to realize that homes have a definite personality all their own. One might say that they assume the characteristics of those for whom they provide shelter. There's no denying the fact that we must love our homes. Artists have painted the houses in which they live, or in which they were born, since time immemorial. There are millions of homes all over the world. Most of them come and go. But every once in a while, some live on for a century or more. But all of them are the fulfillment of a man's dream. This is a story of a house and museum destined to achieve fame as America's first art gallery. It is the portrait of a dream. House of our story stands in the city of Sacramento, capital of the state of California. It had its beginning over a century ago when the cry, gold in California, brought countless wagon trains to the Sacramento region. It was a time when the words, go west, young man, go west, were on everyone's lips. Most of them came in search for the yellow gold. But others came to old Sacramento town to seek their fortunes in a fast-growing new country, a new frontier. With the passing of the years, the roaring frontier town grew into a city and life became calmer. In 1873, the cry, gold in California, had all but faded into memory. Most of the early settlers had attained great wealth, and they remembered the social whirl of eastern cities. And so, Sacramento society had its day. It was in rooms like these, in the home of Judge and Mrs. Crocker, where the ladies and gentlemen gathered for a gay evening. It was indeed the day of ornate staircases, leading to a ballroom where great-grandfather and great-grandmother whirled across polished floors to the strains of a Viennese waltz. Judge Crocker had arrived in Sacramento in 1852 and had become one of the ablest and most successful men in the state. He had bought his home in 1859 and during the ensuing years realized his lifelong dream. European craftsmen built a museum adjacent to his home which was to contain the largest private collection of art in America. Now in 1873, the dream was a reality. This was an evening of celebration, an evening to pay homage to Edwin Crocker, the founder of the nation's first fine arts museum, which bears his name. In 1875, only two short years after the lifelong dream had become a reality, Edwin Crocker passed away. And in 1885, Mrs. Crocker gave the building and all its treasures to the city of Sacramento. Thousands of visitors each year look at the portraits of the man and his wife who lived here. Portraits reminding us that here truly was one who lived in a house by the side of the road and became a friend to man. Judge Crocker was not to be outdone by any one of his time. He was primarily interested in pictorial arts. He searched for and found masterpieces of paintings, 
and drawings. In a short span of travel through Europe, especially the art centers of Germany, he shipped to California 750 paintings, more than a thousand drawings, and a very large collection of fine prints, engravings, etchings, and lithographs. He was actually the first American to purchase art by the boatload. Today, nearly a century later, the museum has become an integral part of Sacramento's cultural heritage. It has grown beyond being a picture gallery with continuous donations of significant works in several of the arts. For in creativity, it is acknowledged that any article which is hand wrought is within the definition of art form. The California Museum Association was appointed to control policy and to encourage the future donor to take personal interest in the museum's growth. Mr. Frank Kent, himself an artist of considerable reputation, heads the staff as director of the gallery. He is assisted by a group of dedicated professional people. The Crocker Art Gallery is not just a place where pictures are hung. Some of the rooms are not used for exhibits. The Crocker living room is one of them. Here are the furnishings of the original Crocker home, reflecting the grand manner of living in the finer homes of the 1870s. Here, the family and friends gathered for tea or for games. Here, the daughter played the piano for the guests, and here the gentlemen talked to their ladies about their host's art collection. Yes, it's all still here, just as it was a hundred years ago. Only the people are gone. Today, the ballroom is used for concerts, lectures, and other civic affairs. One needs only to look at the bulletin board in the lobby to realize that no less than 80 different organizations make use of the museum's facilities. The staff never has an idle moment. There are questions to be answered, either at the desk in the lobby or in one of the many galleries. Then there's the never-ending work of restoration, such as the minute examination of the condition of a masterpiece. Or work on this 400-year-old tapestry. This is behind-the-scenes activity which the visitor never sees. Many paintings are stored in the museum's lower level. Moreover, donations are constantly received and must be ready for exhibition. Special exhibitions are another feature. Several galleries are reserved for this purpose. Each must be carefully planned, discussed, and executed. Community volunteers assist the small, though efficient staff. These are the members of one of the volunteer groups. These young women devote much time, energy, and effort to the present and the future of the museum Edwin Crocker left in trust to his adopted home, Sacramento. A primary concern of this group is to bring an understanding and appreciation of the arts to school children. Each week, a class of youngsters are privileged to be given an extensive tour conducted by a volunteer at the gallery. The first thing these children come to realize is that the building itself is an architectural treasure built a hundred years or more before any of them were born. And now, 
What do we see at the museum? What should children, as well as adults, look for? In 1964, the first comprehensive catalog of the gallery collection was published. Time doesn't permit showing each of the art objects in this motion picture. That will be an experience when you visit the museum, and it will be one not soon forgotten. Here, we hark back to that time when the individual man sought to learn something of the earth upon which he lived. In the year 787, the Catholic Church created the rules by which social conduct and church form was to be developed. Remember that in those days, one picture could do better than 10,000 words to tell the story of the Bible to the thousands who could not read. The church ruled that the artist must create a Christ who could be in a child's body, but must never have the mind of a child. And so the head of an adult was placed upon the body of a babe. But painting and sculpture soon changed into arts to glorify the greatness of man. And as we pass through this wondrous development, we soon see phenomenal changes taking place. An example is the superb Flemish painting. And now the artist, free from the restriction of earlier times, was at last able to paint what he thought would be the idealized babe of his day. Before we move on, Let's look at one more example of Renaissance art. A German painting of the crucifixion. The 17th century was a time of religious upheaval and unrest in Europe. It resulted in the pilgrims landing at Plymouth Rock and the founding of the Protestant colony in America. In the arts, there was a new search for subjects to paint other than the traditional Bible stories. What could the artist do? In the Baroque gallery, three new types of subjects appear for the first time in the early 17th century. One was the first landscape painting. Many of the great Dutch painters, as well as French artists, pursued this new form of art enthusiastically. Another strange new subject was the well-known still life. During the long cold winters in Holland, the painter sat in the kitchen, and while there, began to paint the fruit or vegetables purchased by his wife. And we must not forget the artist who went to the corner alehouse to sketch people. This is Hendrik Terbruggen's elated troubadour. Another Dutch painter, Pieter Bruegel, the younger, went out to the farm to paint a wedding scene. The gallery has a painting by his younger brother, Jan, the river scene in Holland. David Pinier was another of these 17th century modern revolutionaries who spent time in a tavern. And finally, there was Andres Boeck, whose painting, Women Fighting, puts us right back in the kitchen again. Rococo is a word associated with the exquisite beauty of a mollusk shell called the scala. And this symbol became a part of paintings, a part of the design in an ornate fireplace. In 18th century furniture, and even in sculpture. Another way to remember this colorful period is the wonderful dress and the white wigs used by the aristocracy of that time. George Washington wore the white wig at his inauguration when he became the first president of the United States in April of 1789. 
the painting His Family Tree by Carl Hoppen illustrates the tasteful way of life and the elaborate costumes and manner of the people. The arts became very theatrical, picturing gay parties and romantic scenes in impressive plazas. The ancient gods of Greek lore were subjects for such famous artists as Francois Boucher and Johann Platzer, who created the renowned Marriage of Venus and Mars. We most effectively see the trend toward ornate arts, the overabundance of elaboration in the lives of the 19th century people, by examining some of the paintings in the 19th century gallery. The arts basically became very literary. The painter pictured illustrations from famous poems, and novels were brought to elegant living reality in the artist's pictures. However, there were those who refused to become enslaved. They looked to other cultures and to the wonders of nature for help, and their efforts heralded the future of the arts for the 20th century. The contemporary form of art is considered as incomprehensible nonsense by many. But if we try a little patience and willingness to learn, we may find strange and exciting adventures. This painting called Practice is executed in the realistic style of Rose Ivor. It reflects humor and pathos in the individual. Impressionism once caused a wave of ridicule and indignation. In this gallery, we can see and study a painting called Trunion. It was created by Raymond Levesque. This painting is technically identified as a collage, meaning many ingredients are used in picture organization. The first such types were introduced by Cubist masters Pablo Picasso and George Brock to reintroduce the aesthetic value of textural variety into the art of painting. Another group included the French artist Claude Venard. This is his still life in yellow and violet. There is decorative expressionism, exemplified by Roberto Montenegro's painting called New Moon. And Rufino Tamayo's Laughing Woman. This new art was begun by the painter and today we see its influence in every walk of life. In the architecture. The furniture. And in the automobile, to mention but a few. One of the most striking galleries in the Crocker Fine Arts Museum is devoted to oriental art. We are fascinated and pleased with this ornate altar, fashioned by Japanese craftsmen. We are intrigued by the bizarre and romantic mystery of the Far East by the unique gods of Burma, India, and Japan. We must understand that the Oriental artist depicts natural vistas and creatures of nature as equals in admiration for the beauty which God has ordained for this earth. In short, realism is not a goal of Oriental art. The location or detail of the tree or mountain or stream means nothing. The artist is not concerned with facets of light or shade. 
He cares nothing for perspective, nor is he concerned with reproduction of colors as they appear to the eye. A sensitive stroke of the brush becomes a bird, a tree, seemingly moving in the breeze. Art, the world over, expresses itself in many ways. There's the potter and his wheel, lovingly and painstakingly forming a thing of beauty. There is the sculptor, able to fashion a wondrous likeness of woman out of a block of stone or marble. There is another form of sculpture in which metal is used to form various shapes. There are pieces of woodwork fashioned centuries ago by artisans who had nothing but their hands and crude tools. And there is silver. History tells us that the art of fashioning a beautiful chalice like this is an old one indeed. Fine Wedgwood China, exquisite in detail. Figurines that the craftsmen of Germany and England created in the 17th century. And jewelry, an ageless and beautiful ring made by hand for the slender finger of a queen. All this is art. All these things are there in your museum to look at and admire. Well, we've shown you a sample, a thumbnail sketch of the treasures contained in the gallery that Judge Edwin Crocker built a hundred years ago. These children have seen all this and much more during their tour. Each year, many thousands, citizens of Sacramento, tourists, guests of our city, visit this gallery. Have you visited this landmark? this house by the side of the road. And those of you who have, how many times have you returned to again and again marvel at the treasures in this portrait of a dream?